Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So I wanted to make this new series that I'm going to be creating surrounding AWS compliance and just kind of cloud compliance in general. Uh, the reason I want to make this is because I see somewhat of a gap between the actual business logic that I'm seeing from companies at a high level and more of like the technical engineering that interests a lot of you guys online. Um, I think there's a lot of cool content out there in terms of engineering, but I also think that there's not much creating that bridge between the two aspects of compliance or of the actual field of cloud security engineering or cloud engineering, specifically with AWS. And I really want to bring that to the forefront with this series. So I'm going to title this AWS compliance in the cloud or compliance in the cloud, but I'm going to be spanning a few different compliance frameworks starting today with the AWS CIS framework. Now, there's other frameworks such as NIST CSF, NIST 853, FedRAMP Monitor, IL2. I mean, the list goes on and on. Some of them are more stringent than others, whereas AWS is very much, you know, go in and turn on these resources or automate the creation or turning on of these resources and you're going to be compliant. It's about 27 different rules, I want to say. I have the list here. But it really helps your organization and, and you being the people that make up that organization understand you know why you're being compliant or what the necessity of being compliant is and then how to actually go in and turn on those resources or become compliant so you can you know get something as stringent as a SOC 2 adjustation in the future, which is another compliance framework. Now, like I said, the main reason that you want to actually try to obtain compliance in the cloud or compliance in general is that you want to market yourself as a company or you want to help your company market itself as a trustworthy person in that space or a trustworthy entity in that space. So for example, if, if your data is being protected in the right ways or you're compliant in the right ways in terms of what you're using, a lot more customers or users are going to see you as a trustworthy entity in the space and they're going to want to, you know, put their email account or sign up for a newsletter or buy a product or become a user of some specific service. This is a huge part on the business logic end that we need to understand as engineers because all the time that we're spending on creating these beautiful solutions that you and I might like, someone on the you know the business side of things is trying to then sell that solution so compliance is really the way in which the business logic end and the engineers kind of come together and they say you know this is what we're performing as a service or this is what we're offering as a service here's how we're compliant or here's how we can become trustworthy to our users and then marketing and sales can pick it up from there and actually go and try to sell that product or that service i hope at a high level all of that made sense now the goal of this actual series is to help you guys understand compliance frameworks and how to align yourselves against them from a technical aspect like i said there's going to be a lot of business logic built into it but business logic is really you know secondary to us going in and automating what we have to automate I will say at the outset that a lot of compliance frameworks base some of their rules and their control sets on policy. And obviously I'm not gonna be writing policy in these kinds of videos. This is gonna be mainly me focusing on showing you guys how to stand up solutions in accordance with AWS CIS and SOC 2 and NIST CSF in the future. I think the AWS CIS series that we have here is gonna be about six different videos and we're gonna be using services like AWS Lambda, the CDK, using infrastructure as code methodologies, and various other things that are going to help us automate our compliance framework. And I really think that this video to start off is going to be super helpful where I show you guys, you know, the rule sets in general, because essentially what you're doing in a compliance framework or when using a compliance framework is you have a set of rules that you need to abide by and automation really helps you abide by that framework in a really streamlined way. So the whole goal of this in compliance is to not only, you know, I don't want to say the word compliance again, but be compliant add a specific framework so you can then sell your product to customers, but also streamline your business so that compliance isn't taking up a huge portion of your time. It's kind of built into the actual software development life, life cycle using the cloud and, and various tools that we're gonna be using. So what you can expect from this series is me setting up technical resources or just resources in general, and me writing a bit of code in the actual videos themselves. So all of this is in an attempt to help you guys see the journey from start to finish from business logic end and an engineering end so that you can become, you know, and get a, a great job in cloud engineering, cloud security engineering, because compliance and how to automate compliance is actually huge. And it's a it's a awesome skill set to have when you're trying to apply for your job. So if this kind of compliance journey is something you guys are, you know, looking forward to learning more about, definitely leave a like down on the video. 
I'm going to leave all my social links in the description below. Feel free to follow me on all those if you want to kind of keep up to date with when these videos are coming out. I'm going to try to make, you know, two a month. I know that's a bit aggressive, but give me a little bit of time. Be a little bit patient with me because I'm actually going to be writing code and building some of the solutions out so you guys have a robust view of what compliance actually is. All right, so a huge part of being cloud engineers is the security portion of it. But the compliance portion, like I said, is the less sexy version of the actual security process. This is mainly because before cloud came out, it was a very lengthy policy process to try to get compliant in some sort of framework, but also the frameworks that are outside of cloud are much more stringent than something like AWS CIS with what we're actually gonna be going over. You know, you have, like I said, NIST CSF, which is gonna be the National Institute of Standards and Technology, kind of the framework that they put out. It's gonna be less stringent than say like a federate moderate, which is like a government framework but it's gonna be much more stringent than something like AWS CIS. Whereas AWS CIS translates directly to resources in cloud that you can turn on directly to actually become compliant right away. So that's the beauty of this portion of, you know, compliance in the cloud. We're gonna be able to write tons of automation here and have tons of automation opportunities to actually learn as we go along. And I think this would be a great learning lesson for a lot of you guys that are trying to get into cloud engineering because we're gonna be using a lot of the programming languages that I talk about in my other videos. And I'll leave links down in the description below if you guys wanna check out which ones I recommend or anything like that. But we're also gonna be using the services that I recommend a lot to, you know, that you guys should be learning if you wanna actually get a job right away in cloud engineering, in cloud security engineering. I always find it helpful to understand much more why I'm doing what I'm doing so that I, if I, you know, choose to go into business for myself when I'm older or when I'm more mature in my career, I can actually do that. Essentially, like I said before, cloud compliance is really gonna help you attract users, gain partners within the spaces that you're working in, and actually create a connection between the engineering side and the business logic side. I know a lot of us have, you know, aspirations of only being the smartest engineer, but the best engineers are the ones that actually understand business logic and understand the sales side of things. Although a lot of us, you know, tend to not put too much weight into those things. It's, it's really great if you wanna go into business for yourself and you wanna build an application on your own. You have to be able to sell it and tell you know users and potential customers and potential partners why they should invest in it or why they should be interested in it as well. Because if you're just going based off of you know what you say is best practice, it's gonna be hard to sell that. So compliance frameworks really help you kind of gain a framework, hate to use that word again, of how you should be selling your product and where your product kind of fits in a certain space or industry. So just to lay the ground rules right off the bat, like I said before, a lot of compliance frameworks are gonna have a lot of policy baked into them, which means you're gonna to have to actually cover those controls that you see with document-based and procedure-based protocols. But for something like AWS CIS, we can directly hop right into it right now and I can run through all the controls that we're gonna be looking at at kind of a high level because there's a lot of them and I don't wanna take up too much time. So if we look on the screen here and let me zoom in a little bit, a lot of the initial controls here such as 1.1 and I'll leave a link down for this document down in the description below. Definitely take a look at it because it really explains in a very general yet kind of, it's well worth to take a look at this. Uh, so the first couple rules are going to be based around just basic account security, right? So 1.1, and you see on the, the sidebar here, it goes all the way down from 1.1 to 4.3. There's some gaps in the middle there, but definitely take a look at all of them. So avoid the use of the root account. I'll explain what this means in a video further on when I kind of go through everything at a much more granular level. But essentially, if you make an AWS account, that's gonna be your root account. You have to make an IM user and not use the actual root account user that comes with the account itself because that root user is gonna have permissions to every single thing in your account and that's not really something you wanna be giving out to anyone, let alone yourself, using on a daily basis because again, it has permissions to every single feature, resource, you know, billing dashboard, credit card information, all that. So you definitely wanna make an IM user before you do anything, and you wanna not use the root account in your actual AWS account. Next, we have things such as ensure multi-factor authentication. We have uh, delete unused credentials for 90 days. Then we have rotate access keys after 90 days. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but again, it's gonna be in the description below. I really want you guys to just get a feel for what compliance frameworks are because AWS CIS is very, very easy to ingest the information in it. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to do some things with your password policy. It's gonna like require uppercase letters, uh, lowercase letters. It's gonna have symbols. Um, 
you're gonna have to have a number and all this stuff is automatable with lambda and i'll show you guys how to make a password policy lambda in the actual series probably video number two for that uh, you're gonna have to have passwords that are greater than 14 characters prevent password reuse you're gonna have to expire your passwords within 90 days or less you can make it less than 90 days but preferably you want it around that 90 day mark so your users don't actually hate you you're gonna ensure that no root account access keys exist. Don't make programmatic access for your root account. I'll explain more on that later. Ensure MFA is enabled for your root account. Ensure hardware MFA is enabled for your root account. That means you're gonna to have to have an access or a, you know, a backup device such as a phone that isn't directly tied to your personal IM user account or your IM account. And you're gonna to have to have MFA set up for your root account for that because you might have to access root for specific things like billing and whatnot, but you really don't wanna use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so ensure IM policies are attached to only groups or roles, that's 1.16, and I'll explain more on that later. That might not seem like it's a big deal, but it actually is huge. Uh, ensure support role has been created. That's more of a you know operations-based role, but it's still, it's still very helpful. Ensure that you don't have star permissions or allow full access permissions on any of your IM policies. Ensure CloudTrail is enabled in all regions. That CloudTrail is going to be the logging service if you guys don't know. So you're going to want to enable in all regions regardless if you have actual infrastructure in there or not. Because say someone accidentally spins up something in a region that you haven't defined as one of your operational regions, you're still going to want to know that that resource is there because that could be a security risk. Uh, ensure CloudTrail log validation is enabled. Again, we'll go more into that. We'll go into detail on that um, in future videos. But again, you just want to you're going to want to validate your actual CloudTrail to make sure it is what it says it is. You're going to want to store your CloudTrail for 2.3 in an S3 bucket that's not publicly accessible, meaning someone can't come in from the internet that shouldn't have access and directly access that bucket and steal all your logs. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have CloudWatch logs on your CloudTrail logs. Again, we'll go into the automation of that and setting that up with the CDK. 2.5 is in it. ensure AWS config is enabled. Now config is really cool and I wanna dive a little bit deeper into this. AWS config is a great way to make custom rule sets to keep accounts in compliance. And I can show you a dashboard on it and we can build something out with the CDK uh, in the coming series. But config, you can actually create custom rules as well as manage rules. And I'll leave a link down for the, the, you know, the manage rules in the description below. And it really helps enforce compliance and gather data when you're working with accounts at scale. So this might not seem that important when you're working with just one account, but when you're working with multiple accounts, say 50 or some odd accounts like someone like I would be, you really wanna be able to gather data from all those accounts to see what's compliant and what's not. So it's very, very helpful. So you want to ensure S3 bucket access logging is enabled. So essentially what this means is you have that S3 bucket you're storing your logs in. You want to make sure you have an object in that S3 bucket that, that's going to show the actual logs of people accessing that S3 bucket. Because, you know, if your account is compromised, the first thing that someone's going to try to do is they're going to try to delete the actual access logs or the logs that show that they compromised your account. So you want to be able to make sure that you can see, you know, if people try to access that logging bucket. Oh, I just went back accidentally. Uh, you're going to want to ensure that your cloud trail logs are encrypted. You're going to want to ensure that you rotate those encryption keys. Again, I'll explain this more in the future. You're going to want to ensure VPC flow logging is enabled. Just another form of uh, logging that goes between VPCs and it's you know very robust in what you can actually see. Now, for the next couple ones, I'm going to go over them in a high level because there is a lot of them. But essentially in AWS, you can create event patterns, which is you can have things look for specific patterns within your cloud trail logs to see if certain things are happening. So the next couple ones that I talk about are going to be us creating uh, event patterns that trigger off lambdas to do some sort of logic to actually trigger off of you know, for example, 3.1 on the unauthorized API call. So if someone comes in, in, into your environment and makes an unauthorized API call, you're gonna wanna know about that right away and you're gonna want an email sent directly to you. So Lambda and event patterns can be used for that. We have the same thing coming for uh, MFA. You know, I'm gonna kind of skip over these, but definitely check these out in the description because they're all different event patterns that we can create and send emails based off of. So say, you know, you have a certain team that wants to be notified if the root account is used, they can have that email sent to them directly. Whereas you have another team that wants to, I don't know, see if uh, someone signed in without MFA, you can have another email sent directly to that team. So it's, it's very robust in what you can create. And the next couple ones are just going to be all those event pattern or log metric filters you're going to have to create. 
And that's going to be a really fun automation to actually build out. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, I think the next one that we're going to want to look at is 4.1 because the rest of these are just those event patterns. And if you want to look, here's something that could be considered an event pattern right there. So definitely something to, some food for thought for the future, for future videos. Okay, so now we finally get to 4.1 after all those, you know, log metric filters we have to create and how we can create them using event patterns. Now we're going to be doing specific security hardening for things like EC2 and your security groups. Now security groups are huge for your entire overall security and compliance of your account. They're also pretty basic. So although they might seem really, really basic, they're going to be crucial to actually securing your environment because they're what's going to be you know what's going to be allowing access to certain resources such as ec2 or lambda or rds or your databases so 4.1 you want to ensure that no security group allows ingress from a quad zero host to the ssh port 22 we'll go over all these in the future like i said just want to give you a high level same thing here quad zero hosts should not be allowed to port 3389 and you should have a default vpc uh, that has a security group that restricts all traffic. This one is more of a stipulational rule, but you really want to be able to follow these rules so you can show compliance to the actual CIS framework as a whole. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoyed episode number one of Compliance in the Cloud. I hope you guys got a overall view of what AWS CIS is, what cloud compliance is in general, and how we're going to be aligning ourselves using automation to those specific frameworks. If you have any questions, definitely feel free to reach out in the Discord or any of my social medias, even though I would say preferably Discord because you'll get a lot more answers to your questions. Whereas if you reach out to me on social media, it'll only be my answer. And I'm not saying that I'm that I'm right all the time because I'm not. But if you enjoyed this video, please make sure that you leave a like down on it below. Leave a comment if you have one, like I said. Follow my social medias in the description below and I'll see you for episode number two in about a week's time. Take care.